the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12. Now today I'm going to preach a uh, pretty basic sermon, since I look at my uh, sermons that I preach at the nursing home and here, and almost every sermon I preach is, uh, you know, kind of like strong meat of the, of the doctrine. I, I talk about angels, I talk about demons, I talk about unicorns, I talk about prayer, and talk about how to live a godly life. But today I want to talk about uh, something uh, from in Mark chapter 12. Let's look at Mark chapter 12, verse number 28. Mark 12, verse 28. The Bible says in Mark 12, verse 28, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And the title of the sermon this afternoon is called God's Love Languages. God's Love Languages. Now, now the title was inspired by, by a book written by Gary Chapman called uh, The Five Love Languages. It's, it's talking about how you can have a, a good, good, good relationship with your spouse, with your loved ones. But I can also apply to that with God, you know, talking about God's love languages, talking about we should love God with our heart, with our understanding, with our soul, and with our strength. Now, the context of Mark chapter 12 is, uh, is people are asking Jesus some cash 22 um, questions in order to trap Jesus. You know, we have the Pharisees uh, asking Jesus whether they should give tribute to, to Caesar or not in verse 14. And, um, and the reason is cash 22 question is if Jesus says yes, we should pay tax to Caesar, now they may accuse Jesus for not obeying, uh, they are they're, they're, they're putting the man, they are putting men higher than God. But if Jesus says, no, we should not pay tax, then he's defying the law of the land. But, but Jesus Christ um, answers smartly in verse 17. He says that we render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So the whole context is the, the people, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees trying to trap Jesus by asking him some tough questions. Now in verse 28, the scribe is asking Jesus Christ, which is the first commandment of all? We know all commandment is pure. All commandment is, is, is as of equal importance. So they, tra- they want to trap Jesus. You know, which one is, is the first commandment? Which one is the best? Which one is the top commandment? And Jesus answered him in verse 29, The first of all the commandment is, is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. You know, now... We have all heard about the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not, thou shalt not uh, steal, all these Ten Commandments. But if you really study about ten, the Ten Commandments, the, the first four commandments are, are what we call a vertical commandment. It's a, it's a relationship with God. You know, thou, shalt, uh, thou shalt only have one God, right? Thou shalt, have, uh, thou shalt not have other God before me. It's a relationship with God. The first four commandments are vertical commandments. You know, and then the last six commandments are the horizontal commandments. It's, it's your relationship with people. So the whole ten commandments can be summed up in, into two commandments: loving God, loving people. Because if you if you love your neighbor, you are not going to kill your neighbor, right? If you love your neighbor, you are not going to cover it to your neighbor's wife. You are not going to uh, commit adultery with your neighbor's wife. You know, if you love God, you are not going to have other gods before him. So the whole ten commandments. Jesus Christ summed it up as loving God and loving people. It's the first and second. Amen. Now, um, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Now, the Bible says in Romans 13, verse number 9, And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So all the commandments can sum up into loving God and loving people. And, and that's, that's, that's the whole essence of Christianity. You know, if you love God, you're not going to take God's name in vain. 
you know, if you love other people, if you love your neighbor, you know, you're not going to steal from your neighbor. So if you just fully comprehend the two greatest commandments, you, you're going to live a fullness of Christian life. Now, as I talk about the, the, the book, the book, The Five Love Languages, is talking about how you can have a good, good relationship with your spouse and your loved ones, but I want to apply these principles to your relationship with God, because we are the bride of Christ. You know, one day we're going to have the marriage uh, supper of the Lamb with Jesus Christ in heaven. Now, the first love, love, love language mentioned in the book is quality time. Quality time. Now, the article says that uh, in the in the vernacular of quality time, nothing says I love you like full and divided attention. Being there for, for this type of person is critical, be, but really being there with the TV off, fork and knife down, and, and all chores and tasks on standby makes him feel truly special and loved. Quality time also means sharing quality conversation and quality activities. So basically, in order to, to have a better, uh, better time with, 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 the, with the person you love and with the friends you love, you spend quality time with them. With the TV off, you know, say put everything aside, but just having the undivided attention with that person. Same thing with God. We need to put everything aside, just spend quality time with Him. Now the Bible says in 1 Timothy, look at verse number 8. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 8. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So one of the ways to spend quality time with God is spend time in prayer. And Paul says his will, he, he wants every man to pray everywhere. And, and, and also Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says pray without ceasing. So as Christians, in order to spend quality time with God, we should, we should spend time talking to God. And it's really funny, you know, sometimes we ask people to pray, they don't want to pray, they are shy, and they, don't, they don't know what to say, you know, to God. But, but, but the word prayer simply means to ask, simply means to, simply means to talk and beseech God, you know. So if you really love that person, you, you're not going to have any problem to talk to that person. So, so in our Christian life, one of the ways to, to, to show your love to God is simply by talking to Him, simply by having undivided attention, set, set aside at a certain time, and pray to God. Now the Bible also says in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, These were more, more, more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word which all, with all um, the readiness of mind, and searched the scripture daily, whether those things were so. So not only we should pray, spend time with God in prayer, we should also spend time with God in searching the scriptures daily. Not, not, at, not just on, on Sunday, not, not just weekly, but every single day. But what commands us to search the scripture daily. So we should spend time to talk to God and spend time to hear from God in the word of God. So number one, the love language is by spending quality time. Now the second love, love, love language uh, is called the words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. I'm sorry, I, I, I ate too much lunch this afternoon. I can't talk. I can't pound the pulpit that much, but uh, I'll try to be soft. But the second love language is called the words of affirmation, and, and the article says that uh, actions don't always speak louder than words. Hearing the words, I love you, are important. Hear, hearing the reasons behind that love sends your spirit skyward. Kind, encouraging, and positive words are truly life-giving. Now, we've, we've heard the phrase, actions speak a lot louder than words, right? But that's not always the case. Sometimes, you know, it's actually more important to tell someone, I, I really appreciate you in my life. You know, thank you so much for being in my life. So we need to have both. We need to have both actions and words of affirmation. And just simply talking to God, talk to God, just I love you, thanks for being in my life, you know, can really develop your relationship with God. And the Bible says in Psalm uh, 54, verse number 6, I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. So David said it's good to praise God's name. It's good to just appreciate your thanks, appreciate your, your, your like, uh, gratitude to God. You know, simply just thanking God on how much He changed your, he changed your life. And you know, just talking to God in prayer, you know, just simply yield, yield yourself to God, set aside, aside a quality time, and simply giving God your words of, of, of affirmation. You know, before that, before, before I got saved, you know, I made a lot of bad choices, and now look at where I am. You know, I am where I am because of who you are. 
So the second love language is words of affirmation. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. And the third love language is called the acts of service. Acts of service. Now, the article says that uh, can, can vacuuming the floor really be an expression of love? Absolutely. Laziness and broken commitment tells him that his feelings don't matter. Finding ways to serve speaks volume to the recipients of these acts. Now, I talked about I wish you had words of affirmation. Now I'm, I'm talking about acts of service. You know, God wants you to serve Him, but, but not only that, God wants you to serve people. The Bible says in Acts, uh, sorry, Matthew 25, verse 37. Matthew 25, verse number 37. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hunger and, and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king, Jesus, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the Unto one of the least of, 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 of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So, so people are questioning Jesus, and you know, why have seen you being hungry, being thirsty, being in need? And Jesus Christ says, if you just feed these people who are in need, and just help those people who, who are needing you, who need those help, you have done these things unto me, unto Jesus Christ. So, how can we uh, serve God by serving people? You know, how can we feed? How can we feed God? You know, symbolic. How can we feed God? How can we give drink unto God by feeding those people in need? You know, that just makes me think of uh, the cowboy camp. Well, we, we were just uh, being a part of last week. We're spending the whole week with uh, 300 kids, eight hours a day, and, and, and then we feed them a, a whole meal every single day. You know, I think we are fully uh, serving people, serving God. And, and, and these kids, we know that some some of them they have never. They have not eaten since the previous day. You know, these are so some are troubled kids. Some are very, uh, you know, they have, they have some home 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 problems in this kid's life. So I feel like, you know, uh, we we are actually serving God by serving people. You know, we are feeding, we are feeding people. We are feeding them both physically and spiritually. In essence, we will show our love to God and show our love through people. So that's why, and that's why, you know, this article says that uh, we need to. Uh, we need to show our action, show our service as an expression of love. So I talk about uh, spending quality time, I talk about that uh, words of affirmation, I talk about um, acts of service. But uh, number four, go to Job 37. Job 37. The fourth love language is physical touch. Physical touch. Now you may wonder, how can you touch God? But, uh, now the article says that. Uh, a person whose primary language is physical touch is not surprisingly very touchy. Hugs, pats on the back, holding hands, and thoughtful touches on the arm, shoulder, or face, they can all be ways to show excitement, concern, care, and love. Physical presence and accessibility are crucial, while neglect or abuse can be unforgivable and destructive. Physical touch fosters a sense of security and belonging and relationships. Now, you might ask, how can I touch God? But the Bible says in Job 37, verse 22, Job 37, verse 22, the Bible says, For weather cometh out of the north with God is terrible majesty. Touching the Almighty, and we cannot find Him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. He will not flee. But when God talks about touching the Almighty, talk, touch, touching God, of course it's symbolically by touching God. But the Bible specifically associates that with God is, is of terrible majesty. He is excellent in power. So how can we touch God? Simply by touching His creation. You know, touching what He has done in your life. Just imagine, you know, just think about this. We can see God, we can touch God through the manifold of His glory, through creation. But we should also think about how much He has touched your heart. You know, that's how we can touch God. We can relate to God by how much He's touched you, how much, you know, He's just touched the surrounding, touch all these glorious creation. Look at all the plants, look at the, the sky, look at the heavens to show the glory of God and, and just develop a relationship with Him. Touching the Almighty, and uh, we cannot find Him out. He's acting in power simply by uh, realizing how much 
God has shown His love to you by touching your heart and can give back your power to God. For the first Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. Now the, la now the last love, uh, love language is uh, receiving gifts. Receiving gifts. And we all love receiving gifts, you know, whether it's birthday, New Year's, Christmas, all these holidays. But, uh, he, but the article says that uh, don't mistake this love language with materialism. The receiver of gifts thrives on the love, thoughtfulness, and effort behind the gift. Gifts are visual um, re re representations of love and are uh, treasured greatly. So basically it's talking about uh, the thought behind the gifts sometimes can mean uh, a lot. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse number 11, 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 11, and the whole chapter is talking about um, spiritual gift. You know, talking about gift, gift of tongue, gift of speech, you know, gift of faith. But in verse number 11, the Bible talks about, but the, all these work of that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, in verse 1 and 10, the Bible talks about all these different kinds of spiritual gifts. You know, the gift of faith, the gift of prophecy, talking about preaching, the gift of teaching, and the uh, gift of ministry, you know, but in verse 11, the Bible talks about all these gifts is from the self-same Spirit. Basically, God gave you all these gifts. It's from one Spirit, all these gifts. You know, we are different members in Christ, but we, are, but we are one body, and all these gifts are given by one God, one Spirit. And the Bible says, dividing to every man severally as he will. So that's why I believe every saved Christian has at least one spiritual gift. Because the Bible says, these gifts are dividing to every man, severally as he will. Sometimes he might, he might divide to you more than one gift, you know, according to his will. And the Bible says he's dividing to every man the spiritual gift as he will. So, so if God gives you these gifts, you know, it's reasonable for you to give your gift back to him. You know, to use, use this talent that God has given you to give your talent back. That's why the Bible gives you the, the parable of the talent. Are you going to bury the talent that God gives you? Or are you going to invest in that? Or are you going to give it back you know, to other people or give it back to God? If God gives you the gift of, you know, singing, you know, sing, sing glory, sing, sing the glory music and give back to God. If God gives you the gift of preaching, you know, maybe, you, maybe God wants to use you to edify other people. So since God gives you this gift, it's reasonable for us to give this, back, to give, give this big uh, gift back to God. I eat way too much today. But uh, uh, turn the Bible to first, uh, first John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. And uh, not only we need to give the, the spiritual gift back to God, we also need to offer ourselves, right? We need to give ourselves to God as the ultimate gift, as the ultimate sacrifice. You know, talking about receiving the gift, talking about giving gifts to God. So uh, I started talking about that number one, quality time, spending time with God, you know, in prayer, in Bible reading. Number two, words of affirmation. Sometimes words speak here louder than actions. You just simply tell you know, your friends, talking, talking God, how much you appreciate Him in your life. You know, but we, we should also have acts of service to serve God by serving people. Talking about a uh, physical touch. Just think about how much God has touched your heart. How much you know glory He has shown you through His uh, creation. And uh, number five, talk about. Receiving gifts and then uh, give, you know, I'm trying to give back the gift that, that God has given you, and more importantly, give yourselves as the ultimate sacrifice, give it back to God. Now, let me draw a conclusion of this message, first in chapter 4, verse number 16. So, why should we love God? You know, why should we love God? The first in chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says, 1 John 4, verse 17. And we have known and believed the love that God had to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and he in him, and God in him. Hearing is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So why should we learn all these love language? Love of God with our understanding, heart, soul, mind, and strength, because He had first loved us you know, by giving us His Son Jesus Christ. You know, I think I talked about that 
just by sacrificing yourselves is not the most loving act. Just by sacrificing yourself is not the most loving act. Loving act. What's the most loving act is you are willing to sacrifice your son. You sacrifice, you know, your 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 son. I think it's more loving than simply by sacrificing yourself. That's about in Romans chapter number eight. He that spirit not his own son, but gave him for us all. You know, it's, it's actually more loving to sacrifice your loved ones. You know, it's actually more loving to do that. So why should we love God? Is because He first loved us. And the Bible says in First John chapter five, verse number three. First John five, verse number three. For this is the love of God. Some people don't know what love I mean. But the Bible tells us, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. You know, so the Bible says. The definition of the love of God is we keep His commandments. Now, now there are a lot of people uh, there uh, who are Christians think it, it, it's all about emotions and feelings. They just, they just uh, don't worry about all, all the laws or the, or the Word of God. The Bible says, you know, there's one thing to show love of God is by keeping His commandments. You know, Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, of course, we need to obey His commandments out of love, you know, out of a great... Um, uh, it's like out of great fellowship with God, but keeping the commandments is very important because if God tells you to do something, and if you want to show love, you want to you want to follow, him. you want to you want to obey. Him. Now, uh, now people always, people always talk about uh, that uh, Christianity is not a religion but a uh, relationship, um, but I believe it's both. I believe it's both, you know, because the Bible says that in, in James chapter 1, verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. But pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and, and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So the Bible talks about we need to have a pure Religion undefiled. How to do that? Visiting people, visiting people in need, and also keep yourselves inspired, keep yourself away from sin. That's what we mean by um, pure, pure um, religions. Um, I'm not talking about we should uh, be confined into a uh, false tradition of men, but we're talking about following the, the law of God. That's what the Bible defines as religion. You know, we should, we should have both. You know, we should have our religion from a good fellowship, from, from a love with God. You know, so we should love God and love people. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thanks so much for this time uh, to, uh, to preach your word. And just help us develop a, a much uh, firm love for you so we can, we can serve, uh, serve you with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And just help us um, grow in love and grow in our service um, to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.